Okay, are you ready? Yes. All right. Three, two, one, and let's rock and roll. Hello and welcome, everyone. I'm Corey Hofstein, and this is Flirting with Models, the podcast that pulls back the curtain to discover the human factor behind the quantitative strategy. Corey Hofstein is the co-founder and chief investment officer of Newfound Research. Due to industry regulations, he will not discuss any of Newfound Research's funds on this podcast. All opinions expressed by podcast participants are solely their own opinion and do not reflect the opinion of Newfound Research. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. Clients of Newfound Research may maintain positions and securities discussed in this podcast. For more information, visit thinknewfound.com. In this episode, I chat with Wayne Himmelsheim, President and Chief Investment Officer at Logica Capital. To our conversation, Wayne brings over two decades of experience managing long-short portfolios, ranging from statistical arbitrage to factor long shorts. For as deep in the weeds as he likes to go as a quant, Wayne has a philosopher's streak and Twitter is his soapbox. Of course, 280 characters can be limiting, so I start our conversation by putting Wayne in the hot seat and ask him to explain the deeper meanings behind some of his recent tweets. Using these philosophies as a foundation, we then dive into long-short portfolios. We talk about the practical difficulties of managing these strategies, and Wayne explains why he believes that beta neutral is a fool's pursuit. We then switch topics to tail risk hedging, These sorts of strategies are notorious for their bleed, and we discuss whether the payoff is ultimately worth the cost of insurance. Wayne describes a few ways in which bleed can be managed and the ensuing trade-offs with each method. In discussing both long, short, and tail risk hedging strategies, I ask Wayne what due diligence questions he would ask if he were evaluating another manager. I find this question always provides great insight into what managers of these types of strategies actually think is important. Wayne does not disappoint. I hope you enjoy my conversation with Wayne Himmelsheim. Wayne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Wayne, we are going to just go straight to the record of truth, which is Twitter. You're a bit of a quant philosopher on Twitter. You say a lot of things. And it's tough to interpret them all the time with just 280 characters. So I figured I'd start right off and go right to your tweets. Let's play, what does Wayne mean by this? So when we look at your profile, your top pinned tweet says, quote, in quant finance, algorithms that develop from logic and experience that simply seek to mechanize what is already well understood have a chance at success. Those that begin in data analysis, categorization, quantification, or statistical or numerical gymnastics do not. What do you mean? The big takeaway point from this is what many practitioners and theorists have talked about forever for years, which is beware of data mining or curb fitting. To talk about it more specifically to the words I used or to the idea I was trying to convey is that I've seen many quants, I'll call it or beginning quants especially, who have a belief that the ability to use math and to sort through data and start, if they pick up a couple of data sets and they start categorizing and looking in the data, they'll find some interesting patterns or signals. From my long-term experience, I found that most of the stuff you find starting out that way doesn't pan out in the long term. The best approach is actually precisely the opposite, which is You understand trading or you understand the criteria you're looking at. You understand the way some aspect of the market works, whether it's you're a value professional or a growth professional or you have experience with certain types of sectors. Once you have an understanding of and a thesis from your experience in that sector or in that factor or in trading, Then you say, is there a way to systematize what I'm doing, what I'm thinking? Is there some mathematical procedure or algorithm that can stick to the process that I have that I generally use from my long-term experience doing this or that? That is definitely the only way, in my opinion, that quant can be successful is when you've taken something that has where you've made mistakes, you've learned and you've experienced it, and you just figure out a mechanism to systematize it. And that is really just to be able to stick to a discipline or perhaps use better mathematics to make it more precise 
that's very different than starting the other way around. How do you think about testing something like that where you're starting from a place where you already know there was success? There's almost somewhat, to a certain extent, embedded survivorship bias. You know these rules have been successful for you in the past. You're starting from this basis of maybe discretionary trading and you're trying to sharpen the rules through some sort of quantitative systematic process. But to a certain extent, because you know the rules were successful, the back test is necessarily going to look good. How do you think about hypothesis testing this? Right. So in a way, that's almost curve fitting to your known understanding. You're like, oh, wow, it works. Yeah. (laughs) And yes, it does, because you know it does. So that's something that's certainly to struggle with on the side of the coin that I previously explained. The answer to that, in my view and from my experience, is that The testing is to find really the best method of operating something that you know works. Let's go with an example. If you believe that trend following works, and I believe it does, it's a good process. Time series momentum in the market has been validated time and time again by many studies and been shown to be successful over hundreds of years in markets. It makes sense. It has a lot of relationship to human behavior. So if that's your thesis, you know it works. The testing is, okay, well, Under what time frame? So you test one month, two months, 12 months, 18 months. And so the testing in and of itself is not to determine does it or doesn't it work because you have that understanding. The testing is to find is there an optimal time frame? Is there an optimal stop loss amount? These are the things that help you optimize what thinking is already valid. That's where it can be helpful. All right, we're just going to completely diverge from my intended path here, but you brought up the idea of optimal parameters. This is something that I do a lot of research on. How do you think about balancing the idea of finding those optimal parameters and doing this research versus over-optimizing for the parameters and almost creating an overly fragile system because you're relying on that parameterization? I think you just said it best, is if you overly optimize, it gets fragile. So how I I led the witness on that one. I know. Yeah, leading, Your Honor. So Exactly as you said, is you can't over-optimize. And the idea there is when you're trying to go through the optimization process and your testing periods, when you look at the data and you look at the results, you have to look with not such a fine lens. That's the way I'll describe it, at least from my experiences. So if you tested, for example, go with a prior example I brought up, which is momentum. And so time series momentum. And say one test, two months, three months, four months, and you go all the way out to 20 months or or a year and a half, 18 months. In that process, you're going to see that Perhaps just to use an example, it gets higher and higher and higher. Nine months is better than 10 months is better than nine and 11 is better than 10 and 12 is better than than 11. And then it can, let's say it peaks out around 13, 14 months and then it starts to not be as good at 15, 16. Let's just say that that's the way it looked. So one could say, okay, 12.7 months is the peak, but that is too precise. That's over-optimizing. What we then would look at that data and say, you know what, it's somewhere between 11 and 15, and let that be your assumption. So the idea is that you use the data to hone in on the best area, but don't use the optimal as the profound parameter of truth. That's not going to be reliable over time. All right, let's get back on track here. Back to the tweets, putting you back in the hot seat. So I don't have a specific tweet here, but this is something you have written about a number of times. You've claimed that sort of the one true asset class is volatility. What do you mean by that? Well, let's start out with having no asset, right? If you just have cash, then you have no volatility. You're sitting in cash and next week your dollar is going to be a dollar. So as soon as you go out and buy something, whatever that thing is, some asset, the moment you purchase it, you suddenly introduce yourself to variability. Therefore, every asset is some degree of volatility. When you do that, at that moment of purchase, when you're buying volatility or you're buying variability by getting into something, you're unknowingly either long it or short it, i.e. long or short volatility. So to that degree is if you're, whenever you buy something, you should know, am I buying a long vol position or a short vol position? Does that fully answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I guess to push, it sounds a little bit more theoretical than necessarily like literally the quantification of using options to buy volatility is the only asset class necessarily. Like a delta hedge option is not the basis for all asset classes, or is that what you are saying? An option instrument itself is not necessarily, of course, every asset, there's many types of assets, but every asset is 
in a way, optionality. So if I go and buy something which that's not perceived as an option, let's say a piece of real estate, nothing to do with liquid markets, when you buy it, you are buying optionality because you, you want this thing to appreciate. And if there's greater gentrification or urbanization in the neighborhood, then you're long vol. If you believe that, then you're long vol because you've bought a stable piece of real estate that you believe is waiting for a pop based on gentrification in other areas nearby. So you've bought a long vol position. In fact, but it's paying you theta while you're waiting. So it's actually better than an option, true option. You can get your theta and gamma at the same time. So setting that aside is, in my view, any asset you buy somehow translates into an option structure. And with that option structure, will either put you in a position of being long or short a tail or vol. And knowing that, you have to decide which one do I want. And generally, the higher return is going to be associated with a shorter vol position and a lower return with a longer vol position. To your point, that sort of embedded optionality in all asset class, that sort of goes back to the original Merton model of equities are going to be basically a long option and when your fixed income is going to be selling optionality. So there's certainly that tie with a lot of the traditional asset classes from a theoretical perspective. But I think this ties in to sort of the next tweet I wanted to ask you about this sort of long vol or long the tail, short the tails type concept, where you have described that investing is either inherently mean reversion or expansion, which I could see being you either want that tail exposure or don't want that tail exposure. I've also heard you call this convergence or divergence. Can you explain this framework that you use to think about different investing strategies? Sure. Everything in the market is, I'll call it expansion or reversion, and or one could say trend or contrarian. Really, it's the simple idea is that when somebody buys a stock or a market or an asset, you, you either believe it's dropping and it's either going to turn around or the trend is going to continue. So you're either buying continuance or you're buying a turnaround. There's no other reason one would buy. You're not buying it for it to sit still. Therefore, I mean, if you look at big, for example, factor categories, buying value is buying turnaround. Buying growth is buying continuance. That being the case is whenever someone's getting into position, just like payoff or the option payoff structure that we were talking about before, you have to identify whether you're long or short volatility. If you're buying a reversion, you're buying short volatility. If you're buying expansion, you're buying long volatility. So it's the same thing as kind of categorizing your decision into either a vol bucket or an expansion reversion bucket. They're all just different words for the same idea. To me, one has to know that and construct their portfolio accordingly and construct their risk management accordingly. So a couple days ago, you tweeted, mistakes are underrated. As I reflect back on decades in quant finance and trading, the more I realize that the mistakes I made were my greatest teacher. They bite you when they happen, but if you harness them over time, they can foster exceptional growth. Study your mistakes. So Wayne, maybe you can give some examples of mistakes you've made and lessons you've learned. <laughs> mistakes are underrated. There's so many mistakes I've made and there's so many lessons I've learned. Number one, we'll start out by saying my greatest growth and everything that I am today is a function of my mistakes. So I'm, I think mistakes are awesome. That's my number one statement. That said, let me answer you more specifically. I'll go back to when I was more of a, a novice trader in the beginning years. I understood very quickly. So my early days as a trader, I pretty quickly understood the idea of stocks having gap down risk and I'll call it left tails. I didn't know if I thought about it in the distribution terms as specifically as I do today. I certainly didn't. But just the idea that you down moves were much bigger than up moves. Little ups and big downs were the customary in the market. So I, when I initially bought portfolios early on, my first portfolio, I had a long basket of names and I bought options on every name. And I thought, okay, that's just what you have to do. You need protection. It's the right way to manage a portfolio. And it turned out that buying options on every single name with got is just very expensive. You mitigate some of that gap down risk, but then you stop making money. And so then you don't have a trade. And uh, it's actually funny how I learned that when my P&L went down and I said, okay, I'm not making as much money. This is not working. But in between, I had this personal incident that occurred that was really a funny story that I'll tell. And then it got me thinking about how insurance works. It was about 2003. I was still in New York. I had decided to move back out to LA. I had grown up in Southern California, so I, was, I moved back out here. And I, I got out here. I lived in New York. I'd been there for about eight years where I started my career in finance and trading. And so I get back to LA around 03. And when I get here, of course, what's the first thing you do when you move to LA is you, you want to buy a car. And so I got a car. And with a car, you need car insurance. And so I called up an insurance company to get insurance. And 
and they asked me a question, can you have your, can we have rather your previous two years of driving history? And so having lived in New York and I didn't have a car, of course, nobody does in the city for eight years. I said, I, I don't have that. I lived in the city for eight, in Manhattan. And so they came back to me saying, oh, um, that's going to be 6,000 a year. I'm like, okay, that's ridiculous. Not possible. Let me call up someone else. So I, of course, there were these Geico ads on TV. So I'm like, oh, let me call Geico and called Geico. And same question. Can we have your previous two years of driving history? And same answer, didn't have it, lived in New York City, didn't drive. And they came back to me saying even stranger, oh, sorry, you're not insurable. And so I call up an insurance agent and I'm totally bewildered. It's, it's been like two weeks. I'm in LA. I've got a car. I can't drive. I'm riding my bicycle around here, being all frustrated that I can't get into my beautiful new car. And I say to the agent, I just, I don't understand. How could it be? Like, I'm certainly not the first person to move from New York City or from a non-driving area. This is ridiculous. And 6,000 and the other one says I'm not insurable. So he says to me, uh, oh, don't worry. I can find a, a company that doesn't ask that question. Almost. At the time, I said to him, sure, just do whatever you want to do and get back to me. So he gets back to me a few days later. I found uh, this, it was Mercury Insurance, and they don't have that question. And he got a, a quote at 1400 a year. Great. I hit the bid. I'm done. And of course, happy to start driving again. And it was a frustrating experience because I'm weeks in LA and without a car. Not, and this was before Uber, by the way. So let's imagine that didn't exist because it didn't at the time. And so I'm sitting there and I'm telling a buddy of mine about this. And I'm saying after the event, how could it be? I'm the same risk. I'm the same driver. I'm the same guy. And one giant insurance company has me at 6000 a year. One can't even price me. And one's at 1400 a year. It's like hundreds of percents of dispersion on the exact same risk. And I'm like, you know what? Insurance is just weird. Like this all depends on the different assumptions and variables that go into it. And one question is one set of assumptions and they, one other one doesn't have that question. So it's a different set of assumptions. Hence a, a huge variance in the output and a huge model risk. And so as I started thinking about this, I'll call it dispersion of modeling in insurance, it, it led me to an understanding of the markets. You know what? That's the same in options pricing is everybody's using different models. And I, of course, Black-Scholes is this backbone of, but most Volarb traders aren't actually using Black Shoals day to day. They have some tweak on it. If you just, it's not a standard system. They have different assumptions they're making. And with these assumptions across the vol surface, the strikes up and down and across the calendar, upwards and outwards, there are different prices for every option. And that's when I realized, you know what, because of all this modeling and people wanting, having demand for different options at different calendars and different strikes, there's going to be cheaper and more expensive. And so instead of this book that I had that just bought all the same month, all the same, like 2% out across this whole portfolio, I'm like, no, that's not the right thing to do. I have to take advantage of the weirdness in pricing and model variance across the option surface. I mean, this was about six months of thinking and looking and the realization was, oh my gosh, insurance isn't as clearly defined or optionality isn't as clearly defined as one would think. And I learned to much better how to use options in protection a portfolio, how to model, how to look at what other people are perceiving as cheap or expensive and get the best value for protecting a portfolio. So I want to put some of these philosophies into a little bit more, maybe a practical context. I know your background is running long short portfolios as well as running some tail risk hedging type portfolios. You've managed long short equity strategies for a long time. Can you, maybe before we dive into tying these philosophies to some practical examples, can you talk about maybe what your, historically, your prototypical long short portfolio has looked like? Yeah. So going back to this idea of expansion reversion, let's say to use the two examples is reversion would be relative value. So a relative value portfolio is you're buying, quote unquote, cheaper and you're selling, quote unquote, expensive. And you're saying that A is cheaper than B or Coke is cheaper than Pepsi. And from a relative value basis, they should come closer together because they're in the same sector. It's a reversion or contrarian trade. You're expecting them to revert. And to that end, it's a short vol trade. That's a very common and stable way to put together a, a long short portfolio. The other side of the coin is there's the times where because you're short vol, you're exposing yourself to risk. So the other prototypical portfolio is to do exactly the opposite, to take a expansionary approach, which would be long, stronger growth and short, weaker growth. Or if you're a price behavior trader, your long momentum kind of strength in names, whether it's relative strength or using moving averages, you're long some form of price strength and you're short price weakness, which is an expansionary, of course, positioning. So for me, a prototypical portfolio 
should have both elements because you never know when the market is going to present one or the other. And so the right thing to do is to have a bit of both in a portfolio and therefore have, in a way, two different thesis behind your total portfolio and it's like two sub portfolios within an optimal portfolio. It's pretty rare that I actually get the opportunity to chat with someone on the podcast who's done actual shorting, building a long short book. I don't want to pass by the opportunity of chatting with you about some of the practical difficulties of managing a long short portfolio. When you think about taking these ideas from theory and the portfolio you want to manage and bring it down to the level of actually implementing it, what are some of the practical difficulties you face? The first one is one we've touched on already quite a bit, and this is the biggest thing, which is the short vol component, is that by its nature, when you're long and short and most forms of arbitrage or relative value, whether price-based or valuation-based, has a left tail. So the biggest challenge I've experienced and I've seen across the industry is managing that left tail. And supposedly the beauty of long, short and market neutral portfolios is the some consistency of payout. So you can depend on, let's just say, 70 bips a month as a number. But then you come in one month and you're down 7%. That is the tail risk. And that is the piper has to be paid. The pain that comes with consistently profiting on a, on a short vol book is the other side of the trade or the pain of the trade. And so to me, that's number one. The other thing, which is a little bit more in the weeds is I found to be a great struggle in the area of diversification. And what I mean by that is typically quants tend to have larger portfolios, let's say three, 400 positions. It's impossible to find a strong signal in that many positions. If you said your best signal strength or your, your favorite companies are perhaps a list of five or 10. So the problem is that the best signals are fewer and as you get more and more, which you should do to become more of a quant, you, you want to have a more probabilities repeated more often. Therefore, you have more positions, but therefore you're weakening your signal. So there's this really interesting trade-off between signal strength and diversification, both being beneficial. And I've struggled with that idea for years and ended up in two different sides of it. I actually have two portfolios I run right now, which one which is highly concentrated conviction trades because I need that super signal. And one is 400 names, 200 long, 200 short, because I'm taking more of the consistent play the odds betting. Is that a function of the type of signal you're looking at? Or is that a function of the portfolio outcome you're trying to generate? It's precisely a function of the signal. But the signal is based on the type of outcome you want. I mean, they're highly intertwined. It depends whether you're at, one is starts out engineering for an outcome or just looking for a great signal. To me, I kind of do both concurrently. Like I want a particular outcome, but then I know I'm familiar with certain signals. So the best way to apply a certain signal kind of associates with an outcome. And you say, well, how much do I want this outcome in my portfolio? It sort of reminds me of the whole notion of information ratio is equal to sort of your information coefficient times the square root of breadth. If you have to lower your information coefficient, but your breadth goes way up, you can actually end up with a higher information ratio. But it's all about finding that optimal balance, I guess, in what you're trying to come up with. Exactly. So I want to go to your other point, sort of that inherent left tail that's always lurking out there. It doesn't show up in day-to-day -day vol and then you, you walk in. I know we're going to talk about tail risk hedging in a little bit, but are there things as you think about managing long short portfolios that you can do inherently within managing long short portfolios themselves to try to address that left tail risk? I would say to start with how you're balancing it. So the number one tool or mechanism, or rather best word is measure people take is, is beta. So to me, beta is, I'm maybe going against much of the world here, but is silly. I mean, it's a nice measure. It tells you something. But break down beta for a second. Beta is effectively vol times correlation. Vol is asymmetric with the left tail. And correlation is uh, <laughs> has problems. You have no account for nonlinearity. You have the non-stationarity. You have got a lot of issues. So you're taking one problem variable and multiplying it times another problematic variable. And if you multiply two problems, you get a greater problem. <laughs> so the focus on using something as simple as kind of, it's seemingly complex, but it's not as beta is the starting point is don't use that. Judge the names by some other, find some other measure of behavior and find a balance within the portfolio, i.e. the long short exposure should balance by something that is more stable that can be understood to try to mitigate left tail. Is that something you'd be willing to open up about a little more? Because I know 
academically, often long shorts are constructed dollar neutral, just because that's a nice, easy way to do it. In practice, you do hear a lot about sort of beta neutral or, or just sort of vol neutral. Are there any other sort of measures you'd be willing to, to open up about and talk about for these sort of ideas? Yeah. I, I Without getting too proprietary, I like forms of, they're mathematical tools that account for nonlinear behavior, forms of clustering, distance approaches, or I'll call it geometric approaches, I like as tools. I also like the use of what's called stochastic dominance, which is utilizing the actual distribution itself, understanding not to achieve some expectancy, but to understand the characteristic of some asset by the shape of the distribution, and then seeing which ones are stochastically dominant over others, and then shaping a portfolio according to what matches what. Those are some of the measures, I think, that are more viable than things like volatility, which volatility is a very summary metric. So there's nothing standard about the errors of financial assets. Therefore, anything that stops standardizing is going to be at least a better tool. Going back to this idea of engineering outcomes, one of the outcomes a lot of people at least want or express that they want with long shorts is that market neutrality. And and I think hence the focus on beta. When you start to go towards these alternative measures, do you lose the ability to still engineer that outcome? Or is that outcome even something worth engineering towards? Well, let's start with the word market neutral. If you want to make something market neutral, the outcome you want is neutrality. So nothing else matters, right? Therefore, by whatever means you can achieve neutrality. Beta being asymmetric is not going to be neutral. It's going to be neutral the moment you put it on. And as soon as the market goes, actually, you see this a lot with equity market neutral portfolios. The further the market drops, the more they go down, the more beta goes non-neutral. So it gets more extreme as things start going wrong. Therefore, engineering to beta was the error. Because the objective, going back to what I first said, is neutrality, you start with that premise is how do I engineer something that will stay neutral? The very idea of neutral is a funny concept because I don't know even if there's such a thing as neutral. If someone says they want to be neutral, my next question is, well, what do you want to be neutral to? Are you directionally neutral? Are you factor neutral? You could have a directionally neutral portfolio that has equal long shorts with a complete growth tilt or a value tilt or some other factor tilt, like a volatility tilt. So the question first is, you want to be neutral under what premise of neutrality, how neutral. And the more neutralized you are, the less alpha is available. There's a lot of competing ideas here, but uh, I don't know where you want to go further with this. But did that right well answer where you were going? Let's stick on this idea of neutral for a moment. I mean, I guess neutral to what is the right question. And we can talk about maybe market neutrality or factor neutrality. But neutral does seem to imply some sort of negation of exposure, ideally. And it's almost like you're in a well-defined box, you know, at least hopefully what to expect. When you are talking about a long short portfolio that is theoretically market neutral or beta neutral or some sort of factor neutral exposure, when you're managing that sort of portfolio, what should you be concerned about? What would keep you up at night as you're trying to achieve that outcome? I think if you first sought out to know the exposure that you want to neutralize. That's where we start. So if your premise was, I want to neutralize directionality, but I like taking a growth bet, then what should keep you up at night is that you've maintained the directional neutrality and that you're long growth. (laughs) So I guess the easy answer is your premise should keep you up at night. Am I achieving my premise? And if you are, it's also before you go with that premise, if you've wanted the growth tilt, It's that you understand what the exposures are associated with that growth tilt. So you've said to yourself, I know where I want to neutralize, and I know where I want to get my alpha. And if that's where you get your alpha, you have to know that, number one, you have alpha there. So if you look at your growth tilt and measure that against a Fama French growth factor, do you beat it? If not, you've got no edge. So get rid of the tilt. (laughs) And if you do, then you have to manage that edge. So I think going back to it is you first understand your objective. And then what should keep you up at night is, am I achieving my objective? A couple of weeks ago, we actually got together for coffee. We were talking about long, short portfolios. And you mentioned something really interesting to me, which was this idea. I think we were talking about the quant quake, August 2007, quant quake. And you mentioned this idea that volatility emerges because these pairs trading strategies diverge. Like they're concurrent, coincidental events that you can't just inherently manage volatility 
necessarily to manage your positions because the positions go haywire creates the volatility almost inherently. Do you remember that conversation? I do. I remember the good coffee. Can you can you <laughs> rewalk us through that sort of logic that you were trying to explain to me? Yeah, I think the summary word that comes to my mind is, which I saw a lot in the, to me, I believed it was a lot of the reasoning or the um, driver behind the August quant quake is overcrowding. And overcrowding being that there's just so many people doing the same trades. So the idea that vol emerges and, and really, and it's not just your portfolio, is, is the point that I guess no man is an island. <laughs> when we trade in the markets, we trade with millions of other participants. And we find that good pair trade, let's call it Coke versus Pepsi or whatever it may be, rest assured many others have found it. And there's just gobs of computing power and PhDs and all the rest doing the same thing. And so we're all going after the same edge. And therefore, when things start to go wrong, the differences between the different groups is that they manage their risk differently. And one of the best means of managing risk in these market neutral portfolios or in large portfolios in general is liquidity management, is leverage management. So the overcrowded risk is that everybody's in this trade and it's a good trade. That's why everybody's in it. So you've done the right thing. But as some of these bigger shops start to unwind, it becomes a everything going the wrong way and it's wrong. I'll be the first to say that the trade was good, but given how others are needing to exit because they have LPs to answer to, or they have risk that they're managing to, defined stop losses or whatever might be on their total book, those trades are going to go the wrong way. As So long as you're in it, you're exposed to that. That becomes a very difficult thing to manage. And uh, it's a difficult to manage because at the get-go, you made the right bet. I mean, I've experienced this quite a few times, and it's it's hard. I, I know, was there a second part of your question that was, I know you asked me about conversation. We talked, we went on and on about it. So why don't you continue with yeah, where you the, wanted to the, go? I think where we went in the conversation was the idea of, is this just an inherent risk to the type of strategy, or is this something that can be managed? As you act in the market as a long short manager, you know you're not alone, as you mentioned. You are in competition with other long short managers who are potentially going to crowd your trade, which can make position management difficult. Are there things you can do as a long short manager to try to inherently limit that risk? All right, to mitigate. So first off, I'll say is I've noticed that it is increasing over recent years. So I have a feeling that the increase in factor exposure ever since Fama French and the proliferation of ETFs associated with factors and massive shops, the AQRs of the world with all these different factor portfolios, the overcrowdedness around factor exposure has gotten worse and worse. I mean, when AQR unwinds, everybody loses to a degree. 20 years ago, there was no AQR. Or maybe there was. I don't know the exact history, but you know what I mean by that. In general, there was not as much exposure, certainly not to the factor side of things, uh, certainly not before Fama French did their work. So with that proliferation of exposure in those brackets, it is getting harder and harder to manage. That said, to answer the second part of your question, I do believe there's always a, a means to managing it. And I, in fact, I go back to one of the earlier things I, we talked about, which is expansion reversion. So if one were had a reversion portfolio on, which let's say it's relative value, so you have value factor exposure, but concurrently you have some mean expansion on, which is growth factor, then you have two neutral portfolios, but with opposing factors. And therefore, you've mitigated some of the crowdedness that could take place in one of the factor unwinds. However, you could come to the August quake, where both growth and value concurrently unwound. So then you need a third portfolio, right? Maybe you need portfolios ad infinitum, but not necessarily. The point is that there's always potentially another thing to add that has, and this comes down to portfolio construction, that has an offsetting outcome or an offsetting exposure. The typical, and everyone knows, is value and growth or momentum and value, right? But there's more than that, perhaps to add some optionality. And I love optionality for this, right? So when markets get choppy, you want some long vol in the book. And that's, in, in fact, one of the best tools for offsetting exposure in a neutral portfolio, which has a short vol bias typically in a reversionary portfolio, is to have external long vol exposure. So you have some S&P optionality on the books. And when one goes wrong, the other pops. That's the name of the game. So one of the cheeky questions you always get as a quant is, oh, why aren't you out on some beach letting your computer make money for you? And of course, every quant knows it's a constant process of evolution and research and, and a search for 
improved efficiency in your strategies. How do you think about strategy evolution? Strategies have to evolve constantly. That's for sure. This misnomer of that a quant can build it and go to the beach is comical, to say the least. The market is always changing. In fact, it's funny even the idea of factors and categories. If you think of something like value and growth as these two big facets of the market, but even those are evolving to the very idea that you buy a value stock and it turns around and starts moving in your favor. Well, now it's a growth stock. (laughs) So literally the categories are changing on you. So if you bought a value book and you leave it for six months, you now own a growth book, if you were right, that is, on your picks. So everything's always changing. And to manage that exposure, if that's intended, then yeah, you've done a great job. But if you intend always in just being in value, well, then you got to be shifting your portfolio. And then what are value metrics, et cetera, et cetera. All of this is forever changing. A quant's job is as hard as any other job in a so rapidly evolving environment, especially with introduction of HFT and AI, ML, all these just so many more shops and so many more computers computing different kinds of things. We have to always be on our toes. As you look back on your career, have there been any strategies that you ran that stopped working on you? That's a funny thing when you say stop working. In fact, you actually wrote a tweet, a post, uh, which was a post you wrote about this the idea of when will we know whether the value metric or price to book is broken. I think our great grandchildren may know, given the law of large numbers, just things take forever to know whether something is quote unquote broken. So I had this literally this experience where in 1999, I ran a StatR portfolio as one of my first hedge fund, actually, and I ran it for many years and it did very well. It had returns in the high teens, low 20s. And and then in 2002, it did 4%. And I'm like, what's wrong? And I, of course, I tried to tweak and I did this and I did that. And 2003 was equally slow. I think it was like 6%. And by then I had lost all my institutional capital and I couldn't explain it. And I'm beating myself up and I closed up shop. And I said, this thing's broken, quote. No matter what I could test, I thought it was done. And then lo and behold, like, I don't know, 10, 11 years later, I thought to myself, I wonder how that thing would have done. So I I took the model and I bought some data and plugged it in and did a walk forward. And oh my gosh, it came back somewhere around 07. It actually did fairly well in 08 and did well thereafter. And I didn't sit through it. I literally closed up shop and went on to something else because I believed it was broken, but it wasn't. It was just went in and out of a regime, which its regimes were really wide. They were three, four year in or out of favors. Similar could be said these days with trend following. They're not in a very wide, out of favor, wide time frame regime. So we never know is the true answer. And it can be frustrating. But as a quant, going back to the evolution is when Because you don't know if it's broken, the only right thing to do is stop out and move on to finding something that does work because that regime, that out of favor regime might last six months or six years. So you sort of led right into the next question I wanted to ask, which was trying to ascertain whether something is broken, truly broken or just out of favor and what you do in the different situations. I guess if it's broken, you walk away. But when it's out of favor, right, I think if you truly believe it's out of favor, you would just stick with it. But then it's a career risk issue, just blindly sticking with something. So I guess question one is, how do you sort of identify if something's truly broken versus out of favor? And then how do you think about handling those out of favor situations? Yeah, I think that's definitely a time frame answer. What I mean by that, well, it's two things. It's first a measure and then with that measure, a time frame. So the more you don't know, the more your measure won't determine whether something's out of favor, the more time you might give it to try to fix it, to use a general word. So I spent a year and a half fixing, tweaking, studying data, categorizing all this stuff to try to figure out where the exposure, what was happening, because I believed in what I was doing. Turned out I was right many years later, but at the time I was still wrong longer than I needed to be or that I wanted to be. The thing is, the first job is to measure. And some things are clearly wrong and not going to work as soon as you measure them and then you move on. So the stop loss is a function of your time, which is a function of your measurement. To give an example of something where you immediately know, something that comes to my mind is uh, there's the strategy that came about, uh, I don't know, four or five years ago, which was a ETF ARB. It was trading the ETFs that take leveraged positions. I guess they call them levered ETFs, the double longs or double shorts or triple longs, triple shorts. And so there's a group of people that realized that in to create a triple exposure, let's say a S&P triple long, triple short, to create that exposure inside an ETF, one needed to use options. So there's embedded theta or decay or bleed inside that. So a very simple market neutral approach was to 
to short the triple long and short the triple short. In that sense, one is both long and short the market equally. You are neutral to the market, but you get to acquire or, or your alpha source, quote unquote, is this the carry, is the bleed from the, the theta embedded inside the ETF. So you're, you're making money on time decay while you are neutral the market. What a fantastic arbitrage. You're wholly neutral. You're only in literally the market. There's no idiosyncratic exposure, and you're just basically collecting theta. Wonderful, except more and more people started to realize this. Overcrowding ensued. And what happened is prime brokers saw that everybody wants to borrow these triples, and so they increased the short borrow rate on the triples. In fact, to such an extent that the cost of the borrow was greater <laughs> than the amount you made on the decay. And that's the point it got to. So if I earn 8% on the decay, the borrow rate was 9 And so there was no ARB left. Literally, in measuring it, it was gone. Not only was it broken, it was an impossible. So all one needed to do is, in understanding what they were doing, look at 9 is greater than 8. This thing is broken and it's done. And a day later, you move on because it's history. It's been overtraded. It's been found. And I'm out. When there's something, therefore, that's measurable, you can cut your losses much quicker and move on to something new. When it's not measurable, it's when it's difficult. And that comes down to a personal decision. How much time am I willing to spend tweaking and contorting to try to figure out whether I can fix it? And we all have our limits. And at some point, I guess if you decide to, you cut your losses and move on and do something else. Well, I guess that comes down to a business question as well. Exactly. It's, it's not just tweaking and contorting and trying to fix it, but how much time can you spend defending it? How sticky is your capital? Is it tied exactly. up? Is it flighty? Yeah. Um, and what does that mean for your ability to, even if it does come back, still be in business? When exactly. It does? Exactly. Exactly. So one of the questions I love to ask people who are really have a long practical history of managing a particular type of portfolio is how they would do due diligence on that portfolio. So my guess is a lot of the listeners to this podcast aren't going to go out and start running a long short portfolio but they might be evaluating long short portfolios either in mutual funds or LP structure. If you're sitting on the other side of the table asking the questions about someone's long short portfolio, what are the types of questions you're asking and what are the red flags that you're looking for? I've been in that position. So there's so many answers to it because I will ask a lot of questions. <laughs> and I can't think of them all this minute, but let's start at the very top. First off is Every portfolio or many funds only provide monthly numbers. So at the very, very top of the list is get more granular with your timeframes and look at this thing behave daily. Monthly is just ridiculous. And I, when I say ridiculous, people say, oh, a five-year track record is long, but five years monthly is 60 data points. That's absolutely tiny. And it's masking slash hiding a lot of behavior intramonth. So you want to know how this thing behaves. That's the top level ideas. What what can I expect? So number one, you get daily returns and you map this thing. And when I say map, I don't mean necessarily regress because regression has some uh, linearity and or non-linearity issues. But you map this thing. You use certain, I guess, mathematical tools to map this thing next to different exposures and see what is this thing exposed to. I don't ever listen to what they tell me. I just run it versus we have in here about 180 different exposures that we have time series for. Factors or exposures. It could be things like volatility or oil and just go down the list. We've aggregated about 180 of them. And so we'll take any portfolio and map them next to all 180 and say, what is inside this thing? And what's interesting is we most often find or very often find that the things that managers will tell you that they're doing, sometimes they don't even know that they're exposed to other stuff. Like, really, did you know that you had a 30% exposure to momentum? Oh, no, I didn't. I'm actually a value investor. And so I think number one is get granular and with that granularity, identify where the exposures are. Once you've identified the exposures, you start asking questions to understand how intentional that was and how much the manager is aware of the exposures they have and what it is that they're actually doing. And the ones that, of course, are articulately responding and, and very clear about everything that's inside, it has the same findings as yourself, then you know that they're on top of it. And those that are open up their eyes wide and say, oh, really? I'm. What do you mean I'm in momentum? Well, that, that's somebody you should be concerned with because they don't know the risks they're taking. Are there any immediate red flags that stick out to you when you talk to someone who's running 
a long, short book that you say, this person isn't aware of this type of risk, or they haven't thought something through, even without looking at the numbers, just from maybe reading someone's pitch book or the way they explain a portfolio? Yeah, I think to me, the big thing is that the really generic sounding stuff, we take a a value approach and a page is the Fama French, and then they have the, we like good quality companies. I Really? Don't we all? So sarcastically, I shouldn't put it that way, but somebody has to have some premise outside of what you can buy in an ETF. I'll put it as simple as that. And, and they have to have a, a, not just a sound thesis, but something that is, that steps outside of the easily buyable box. I think when I see PowerPoints and so much of them look so similar, they're just kind of telling me all the stuff that is so standard and doesn't give me any insight into what their edge is in that area. There's one manager I met years ago, and this is an example of the opposite. He had worked at Fidelity for 15 years or so and was a specialist in the banking sector. And he just knew things about bank balance sheets and how to look at them that most investors don't because that was his area, just the depth of expertise in that area. That's not my focus. I wasn't as familiar. I didn't have particularly good questions to ask because I didn't know that side of the business. But he went on talking for an hour about so much detail about the specifics, about metrics for banks that were different to any other company. I knew he had a deep understanding of what he was doing. Whether he was right or wrong is a different question, and his returns show how good he is at it. But the fact that he had such good reasoned and depthy explanations, and then you see it in the returns, two and two together is, okay, this guy not only knows what he's doing, he's, it's panning out in real time. So I like when those two things come together. Was this a discretionary manager that you're talking about? He was a little bit more quanty. A little more quanty? Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the role of discretionary versus quant in long short? Is this a realm where quant has a greater edge than discretionary? Are there certain types of long short portfolios that discretionary might have an edge over quant? I can't think of an example where one is more optimal than the other with respect to a specific type of portfolio. I mean, I could say, for example, if you have a large portfolio, a 200 by 200 market neutral, that's impossible to do discretionarily. So some things are just on the side of obvious, but I don't think either one is more suited to a particular type of investing. It's more that they're just different beasts. I personally love quant. The reasons I love quant are the same reasons that many people do is that things can be categorized and understood and can be a process can be repeated consistently. So I think the only thing that with discretionary approaches is you can have the exact same thesis as a quant. You could say, okay, we're going to buy, I talked about bank stocks a few minutes ago. So we're going to value banks under this special metric and we're going to buy all those that are cheap and sell all those that are expensive under these kind of deep metrics that we understand about banks. Fine. So if that's your approach, the quant manager is going to bucket the names and they're going to put a certain amount to each one based on some matching or some algorithm that can identify the risk, whether through vol or some clustering mechanism. And so they're going to have these balanced pairs. The discretionary manager is going to say, well, I'm going to get a, I like this one a bit more. So I'm going to take a bit more of that one. That's neat, but I don't know how you can show consistency over time when you're making these decisions that don't repeat, I guess, the judgment side of it. At the same time, what if that discretionary manager has better numbers? Then you say, well, they're making those gut decisions, but that's the performance I want. So I don't that's a very hard thing. And I don't know that there's a right or wrong. I think I know what my answer is. Now that I've sit here giving you a whole different answer, I know exactly what the answer is, is with investing, you have to go with what is you. I think everybody, every person is different. Of course, every person is different. It's not what I think. It's what I know. So the most right thing to do is to look within yourself and ask, who am I? What do I like? And go with what you feel good about. And you see this all the time where doctors love medical stocks and drug stocks. It's an area they know. So likewise, if you're a quanti kind of person, then lean to quant. If not, you know, you don't. And there's good and bad in all of it. So the best you can do for yourself by going with what you know is because you'll be able to ask better questions and be more comfortable with what's happening day to day. Reluctant to move on here because I feel like we've just started scratching the surface of your knowledge along shorts, but there's this whole other category that I know you have a large degree of expertise in, which is tail risk hedging, which I want to make sure we talk about. So Reluctantly, I'm going to switch topics here a little bit to this idea of tail risk hedging. So I have this really sort of pithy catchphrase, which is no pain, no premium, which I think is a lot of what we were talking about earlier. And it basically means that 
without the potential for losses, we really shouldn't expect to earn a risk premium. So practically, this tends to translate to most traditional assets have negative skew. You have fat left tails. You wrote this great paper called The Illusion of Skill, which I think I'll uh, make sure we link to in the show notes, but everyone should read, particularly those who like a little bit of math. And in it, you demonstrate that skew and kurtosis really go hand in hand. With this idea of tail risk hedging in mind, how does one go about trying to protect themselves from big negative outliers? Yeah. So, of course, uh, skew and kurtosis and even higher moments all go hand in hand because it's all just one distribution. So it's one characteristic. And every different type of asset classes have different type of characteristic shapes. So that's for sure. Is I think first, one should obviously understand what they're exposing themselves to. It's very much the conversation we were having earlier. Is this more of a right skew or, or left skew exposure? And most things, as you rightly said, are negative skew. All stocks are typically negative skew. And so the question becomes, how do you mitigate that exposure? It's very, very difficult. The number one way I've found, the only right way, I'll say, is to buy the only thing that is extremely right skew, which are options. So if you're going to be in a portfolio of stocks, if it's a diversified enough portfolio, you have optionality on, for example, the S&P, or if you're in a small cap basket on the Russell, or if you're in five names, you can, might buy optionality on those individual names. The point being is the only way to get rid of the left tail is to balance it with a right tail. And to have that, obviously, you have to have the right offset temporally. You need the time association to match that. When this thing goes down, the other thing goes up. So you need to understand the, the time relationship between the two. And that's very simple. If you own a basket of stocks, if they fall, the S&P goes down. That's pretty clear. If you have enough of them. Once you can come to those understandings, if you own optionality on the other side, you own right skew to protect your left skew. I guess you could synthetically cut left tail with things like stop losses. And that's what actually trend followers do. So stop loss management is a good synthetic left tail mitigator, but then you have gaps. You can gap through a stop loss quite easily. And if you're not a quant discretionality, you could say, well, let me, I'll let it go a little bit further. That's one of the problems with discretionary management is not obeying those exact lines or exact levels like a quant or a system would. So stop loss management, I'll call it as a synthetic left tail mitigator is good, but not 100% reliable because of number one gaps and number two discipline. So therefore, the best means, which you don't even have to think about, is to have a right tail offset, which is an option. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it sounds like what you're saying is instead of trying to think about getting rid of the left tail, you're talking about adding an asset that will exhibit right tail behavior at the same time as that left tail is exhibited. Exactly. Counterbalance. So instead of trying to get rid of, it's that you can't get rid of. So I think financial theory would say like if an asset exhibits a right tail, probably has to have a negative expected return, sort of this, it's almost like an insurance payout. And I think that's the argument uh, frequently against something like options where you're trying to engineer this right tail payout is that the insurance is just expensive, potentially even overly expensive. Roni Israelov, I think, wrote a paper called The Pathetic Protection. It was something to the effect of pathetic protection the elusive benefits of puts or something like that, where he showed that most investors would actually just be better off from a cost perspective, just reducing their beta rather than buying puts because there's all these problems associated with puts. They're, they're expensive. And then you have these rolling timing issues that go along with them. From your perspective, is protection ultimately worth the cost when it comes to things like puts? Yeah, it's funny, this idea of expensive. If I think to myself, most of the th expensive things I can think of are really worth it. <laughs> I mean, drive a Porsche or drive a, I don't know, a Toyota and expensive is feels, it handles the road better. I guess you get what you pay for is part of my claim I'm making. So when it comes to portfolios, is that also true? I, I mean, I think for the ordinary investor, where it's very difficult to learn to properly trade options and how to manage optionality and, and rolling and all the Greeks and options modeling, that's an uphill battle. I think probably if I were talking to kind of an average investor, I would say just lower the leverage or uh, the beta in your portfolio. Yes, I agree with that answer. I agree with that paper. I hadn't heard of that paper. I haven't read it, but I agree with that reasoning. At the same time is one could learn a little bit and be able to engineer outcomes or could buy a tail fund or buy that exposure from a professional who does that, whether in a fund or in a managed arena. 
But if one were to do it themselves, I think the road to learning it, if they have interest, is not that difficult. I mean, if you're a doctor or a lawyer or just a busy family person, you don't have time, that's fine. So you go the other route. But if you have the interest and the passion, it's not impossible to get from zero to 80%. You might not get to 99% proficiency, which really only comes if you do it every day, all day for years and years and years. But you can get a pretty deep understanding of what to do. And there, as far as what to do and managing the cost of insurance is, it is worth it. The point you made earlier is whether right tail always comes with a a negative payoff. There's always a trade-off. So the better the right tail, the lower the hit rate. And the worse the left tail, the higher the hit rate. So what do you want? Do you want hit rate or do you want the risk? And I think if you are willing to accept a lower hit rate for some right tail, you can get there, but without much of a loss. And and let me use a different example to put it into day-to-day terms. Let's say the insurance that we all buy without even thinking, like we don't say to ourselves, is it worth it to have health insurance? Is it worth it to have car insurance? We all just go out and buy it because you don't get in your car without it. And you don't wake up and cross the street without health insurance. So there, there's not even a question, but when we're buying it, we make decisions like what's our deductible and what's our total coverage. And so there's these, I'll call it knobs to turn, which are the same knobs that one could learn and turn on portfolio optionality. So for example, you could buy just 10% out of the money or 20% of the money options on the S&P. You spend a little bit of money, just like health insurance premiums. You have a portfolio, let's say it's a it's a million dollar portfolio and you're spending $2,000 a month on this little, you know, and say, okay, that's my cost of insurance. And when 2008 comes, you make a fortune and it covers half your loss. And was that worth it? Well, if you did better and slept better and all your friends were crying and you were up having a a nice scotch one night when everybody's suffering, then you did better. Then you lived through it. So part of it is the emotional experience and living through it. Part of it is how do you want to feel day to day? Going back to the point is you could learn a little bit, you can turn some knobs, and you could have some insurance in place that protects you or, of course, go with a professional. So part of this idea of whether options are expensive or not is really comes down to whether you're getting what you pay for, which is what you mentioned. Nassim Taleb argues and has argued many times that really far out of the money puts are actually what people should be buying because as humans, we just have a really hard time fundamentally understanding super low probability events. So those way out of the money put options are consistently underpriced because those rare tail events happen more frequently than they're priced to happen with the options. Do you take the same view? Not really. I take the same view that people don't fully understand highly rare events. That is true. And don't account for how much more frequently they occur in capital markets than in real life. So kind of the quote unquote infinite variance associated with fat tails. So that part of it, what Taleb says, wholly agree, and I'm the biggest practitioner and a believer in all of that. The difference is that I do not agree necessarily that buying further out is better and cheaper. It is well-known what's called the volatility smile, which is that the skew picks up as you go out of the money. An option that is 20% out costs 10 cents, whereas at the money costs, let's say, $3 on the S&P, as an example. People might look at that and say, well, 10 cents is dramatically less than $3. Sure, in nominal dollar terms, that's much less money. But the 10 cents, if that only happens once every 30 years, then you are losing so many 10 cents versus the $3 at the money option. The expectancy is so much higher. I mean, the market could be down five out of 12 months a year. And so you're getting paid so frequently that it's paying for itself. But those will still have great convexity when the market really cracks. So in my view, the lower deductible is actually cheaper because you're making money more frequently. So it's about cheaper expensive is expectancy based. And yes, if you buy 30% of the money, to Taleb's point, that will happen more often than you think it might, and you don't understand that, so you might want to buy a few of those. But if you really want to protect all the time, you buy at the money. And what's nice is about doing that is that it's more expensive, but there's so many events that occur from being at the money. I mean, the month of May was a, a great correction from at the money, and the a magnitude of about 6%. So the May payoff might have fully covered your bleed in January through April. So every four or five months, you get your money back. 
that's a much easier thing to handle than waiting 22 years for a payoff, which by that time, your kids have taken over your portfolio and you don't even remember the losses you've had. So much bleeding along the way. So anyway, that's the point. So I think, you know, obviously there's truth. Talib is a very smart man and I agree with, uh, love most of everything he says. But in this case, I diverge with him on where one should buy optionality. We talked about options and optionality. Are there other opportunities that you like for protection? Yeah, there are some other assets that offer kind of protective behavior against equity markets, typically flight to quality assets, things like treasuries or gold. Oftentimes the dollar against a other major market currencies like European basket of currencies have good characteristics when equity markets are drawing down. And just in fact, recently, uh, just in the month of May, the S&P was down 6%, gold and treasury soared. Those were good assets to own. There's been gold bugs out there for many years. And of course, nobody could ever doubt the reliability of treasuries over time to be flight to quality. That is effectively what they are, is is they're the benchmark. So these things are good to own and they offer, I'll call it put-like characteristics. There is some convexity in their behavior when equity markets fall and they have very little bleed. So these are ideal instruments for less educated investors to have in their portfolio as a percentage of their portfolio that will behave a little bit like puts and give them the the comfort during those heavier drawdown times. The other kind of less known things are certain type. We were talking earlier about market neutral portfolios. I, in fact, engineered a market neutral portfolio just to have that type of exposure where I'll call it defensive market neutral. And so most of the time, it doesn't actually have much return. It doesn't really lose. It, let's say, makes 1% or 2% a year. But in Q4 of 18, it's up 7 8%. It's a right skew market neutral portfolio. That was a highly engineered portfolio with a specific outcome of being acting like a put, but not really costing money. So how do you do that? You're typically long more quality names. I think of a portfolio that's long utilities or Procter & Gamble, and you're short some high flyers. It's hard to keep that making money most of the time or keep it even flat, but you can if you know what you're doing. And and then that has, of course, quality exposure. So when equity markets fall, people run away from biotechs and into utilities. And so that thing pops. So yes, there are many other ways to get exposure to assets that counter behave equity markets and that even have some I'll call it convexity to them, or some option-like shape that are much cheaper, quote unquote, than options. So you brought up May, which I think is a, a really good example of sometimes the things you expect don't always go the way you expect them to go. We had a pretty, I mean, I wouldn't say overly dramatic sell-off, but a pretty good sell-off in May and implied volatility barely budged for the S&P. It was sleeping. It was sleeping. And yet you saw a flight to safety in some of these other assets like treasuries. How much of protection is sort of a moving target with some of this stuff? If you can't inherently just rely on one type of protection for a given sell-off, I mean, how much of it is sort of situation-specific? How much do you have to sort of be changing your protection over time? Or is it the idea of maybe buying a more diversified basket of defensive type positions? The answer is there is absolutely no way to time (laughs) <laughs> what type of protection one needs at one at moment. That's that says probably harder than timing the market, which is impossible. It's like a derivative of timing the market. It's timing the, the risk of the market. I mean, it's timing a crash. It's in the realm of impossible. So, and not just a crash or a crack, but what way this particular crack will play out. That's what you're asking. So it's like a derivative of a derivative. We get into the realm of don't even try. And that's where I would start. It's uncertainty of uncertainty. That being the case, the most robust and only right answer to that is to have a little bit of each all the time. You don't know when it's coming. So in a portfolio, like we just talked about, you have some gold, you have some treasuries, and you have some out-of-the-money put options, let's say on the S&P. You have these things, and they're always there. And in a month like May, your put options didn't do as much as you wanted, but your gold and treasuries soared. And another time in 2011 in the correction or, or August of 15 or Jan of 16, then the put options plus gold did, but treasury didn't or whatever one or two of three of three are going to make it or not. But you always have these things there 
It's like saying, I guess, back to the larger insurance analogy, you have your medical and you have your dental and you have your vision. And so I I don't know where I'm going to get hurt. (laughs) But either way, it's covered. And one asks, well, should I have insurance for the emergency room? Well, yeah, (laughs) that's one out of every X events are going to put you in the emergency room where you're not just calling up a doctor and doing a regular appointment. So the answer is we don't know how they unfold. We have to have all of them and be positioned. And it's just up to a person to decide how much exposure to put in those buckets with optionality being potentially the heaviest quote unquote cost. Again, to me, it's not expensive when you get what you want. But since it is more often a bleed than a payoff is perhaps people should have more treasures and gold and a little bit less optionality, but definitely all concurrently. So let's stick with that word bleed, because I know it's very traditional for tail risk hedge funds to have a very consistent bleed. And I know that you offer a tail risk hedging strategy that we've talked about in the past that you think does not bleed as much, if really at all, compared to traditional tail risk hedging strategies. What do you do differently? How do you think about this problem differently that allows you to avoid some of the bleed, yet still hopefully provide the protection that investors are looking for? There's always a trade-off when you're trying to own optionality without bleed. Per Black-Scholes, gamma and theta, or the convex payoff versus cost to carry, are on opposite sides of the equal sign. And one goes up, the other goes down, and that's it, positive and negative. So you can't have one without the other is literally the math. How do you fight the math? As me, as a super quant, I'd say that's how dare you, right? But I will. I'm going to. How do we fight it is our approach is to, and I'll start with saying that there's always a trade-off. So in generally, the way vol managers have managed that trade-off is to say, that they want to be long some vol, and to pay for that, they're going to get short some other vol, generally short some idiosyncratic vol. So the idea might be you're long the S&P vol, or you're short some specific names that you think are about or should come in. Or So you have long and short vol exposure, and the short ones are paying for the long one, which you think is the one you really need. Or you have, for example, a put spread, where you're long at one level and short at a higher level or a lower level, depending on the side of your spread. But the problems with those is, If the confounding of when you're wrong, you're short the thing you want to be long. So it's like (laughs) antithesis. I want to do what I don't want to do, but I'm doing it. So give the example of a put spread and your spread is to be, you know, you're short from at the money, but then you're long from 10% out and down. If the market corrects 7%, you lose. So you're in options, but you lose. So that's exactly the opposite of where you're intending to do. So I don't like those approaches, but that's a very standard approach for paying for your bleed. The way we approached it was a little bit different, which is where are we going to take the trade-off? So I take the trade-off in sometimes having less than you need. What we do is we trade it. If one thought to themselves that they could trade something, right? So there's a lot of traders out there. People trade everything. You trade, people trade S&P futures, they trade tech stocks. So in general, imagine somebody is a good trader. You talk to your buddy, he's a good trader, he trades the tech stocks. So if somebody is a good trader, well, you could generally learn and trade anything at least a good basket of things. The more you trade them, the better you get at trading them. That's how experience grows. And that's the nature of our learning process. So with that idea as my trading background, I thought to myself, you know what, if there's something I'm going to trade, well, let me just trade long options and see how tradable they are. And it's no different than trading S&P or trading Google. It's just constraining your universe of instruments to only long puts. Okay. So buying and selling long puts, sometimes you have more, sometimes you have less. You're never short. You're always long, but you're getting in and out of more or less per day, depending on your trading procedures or your, in this case, it's an algorithm. So it's a, it's a systematic process of trading. By doing that, you're exchanging your trade-off from having this unwanted short vol to just having too few a puts at any one time. So if you can imagine this scenario, let's say your ideal put position is 100 long puts. That should cover your portfolio. And let's say it's 100 long from 5% out of the money. That's what you want to protect. So you have a little bit of a deductible. And so you have 5% out of the money. In our case, we we actually start from at the money because we want to be fully protected from the first moment downward. But let's say 100 long is the right number against the beta of your portfolio. So, But today, we think that they're a little expensive. They're overpriced. So we're going to sell. We're going to take 50 off the table as a trader, as a swing trader. So you take 50 and you go home overnight with 50 puts. and, And then they're cheaper the next day. So you buy not 50 back but you buy 100. So you go home overnight with 150. You're actually more 
putted than you need to be. But they were so cheap, you wanted to buy more. You come in the next day and they popped up really nicely, even more than you expected. So of your 150, you sell 120. You're only 30 left. If you go home that night and that's the night that an event happens, Trump does something silly. I think that's more often, that happens almost every night, but let's just say it's more so tonight. You come in with 30 puts the next day and you have less than the 100 you need, but you still have 30. So you're 30% covered versus what you want it to be. You're undercovered, but you're still somewhat covered. The point is that making that exchange for some, and sometimes, in fact, you're in more than you need it to be because you by trading, you ended up buying more. So what we learned and built a system around is the trading of them allows you to effectively scalp as a trader would, as a swing trader would, but you're scalping something that you always want to own, which is protection. Sometimes you could be overexposed to protection, sometimes underexposed. You don't know when the event's coming. So theoretically, about 50% of the time, you're going to be right around where you need to be. 25% of the time, you're underexposed. And 25% of the time, you're overexposed. You had double the amount of puts you needed, and you're dancing when the market crashes. So that 25% underexposed is your trade-off. And I'd rather have that trade-off than being short vol. So let's put you on the other side of the table again, like we did with the long shorts. There's all sorts of tail risk hedging products out there now, obviously in LP structure, but many even in mutual fund and ETF structure. What should people look for when they're evaluating these types of portfolios? So earlier I talked about, I'll use the word trade-off, that there's always a trade-off. The problem with insurance is that it costs. We used the word bleed before. So that being the case, everyone who manages tail risk is trying to find some way to manage the bleed, to pay for the insurance. Therefore, something in their portfolio is doing that. When looking into a tail risk strategy, if they say, oh, it it just protects the tail, and the next question is, well, where's the exposure? It has to be somewhere. If you're protecting the tail and you don't look like the bleed of an option, then you are making a trade-off. There is no other way to achieve that. As I talked about before, is most of those trade-offs are finding other areas of vol to short. So vol managers know vol. And so they're, by knowing vol, they, they live in the vol corridor. So they're going to say, well, this is expensive vol and this is cheap vol. And the expensive vol is going to, being shorted, is going to pay for the cheap vol they're buying. Or they're finding some idiosyncratic vol, name-specific vol moves that they can short to pay for their index optionality. Or on the index, they're short at the money, which is bringing in more dollars to pay for some out of the money. So if you lose only 5 or 6% of the S&P, you're actually losing money with them. But if it is a big crack you're making... Or there's calendar spreads where you're, you're shorting front month to have longer term protection. The point being is that there is always a trade-off. You cannot own options and not pay for them. Just like you said earlier, you know, it's the no pain, no gain. Or I think that was your term. I'll call it no theta, no gamma. So that being the case is one has to find out where that pain is. And that pain has to be acceptable to you. So if you say to yourself, you know what, I'm fine with deductibles. I'm fine losing 5 to 10% anytime. I just don't want to lose a dime more than 10%. Then you're fine with put spreads. You accept that risk. But when you're diligencing a portfolio, when you're diligencing a tail risk manager, when you're trying to find one for yourself, dig in to find out where that exposure is and then ask yourself, is that something I'm comfortable to? In the example I gave you with my tail risk strategy is sometimes not having enough protection on the book. So it's a more or less function. It's not a upside down opposite, i.e. short vol function. Therefore, you decide, is that a risk I'm willing to take? Sometimes it'll be there for me, but other times it might not be there when I want it as much. And these are all the, again, to use the word trade-offs that we make. So the number one thing to do is either ask the manager or look in their portfolio, if you understand well enough what positions are doing, to find out where the exposure is, or actually do both. Look in the portfolio and ask the manager where is the exposure. Make sure those two things agree, of course, at least if you can have the knowledge to figure that out. And then once you understand that risk, contemplate whether that's the acceptable risk, because there is, to use both of our points, no theta, no gamma. All right, Wayne, last question for you here. This is the last question of the season that I'm asking everyone who comes on the podcast. And the question is this. Let's say I said to you that you had to sell every investable asset you have, you're 100% in cash, and you can only invest in one thing for the rest of your life. It can be an asset, it could be a, a, a given strategy, a portfolio configuration, but once you set it, you're done, you can never touch it again. What would it be and why? Spy. And by the market. It would be spy for sure. Why? The number one benchmark 
for everyone is the market, meaning every promotional material, every advertisement, every manager you talk to is, oh, we beat the market, we're trying to beat the market, we're trying to beat the market. That's what everyone is trying to do. And yet, when you look at the statistics, something like 92% of managers and mutual funds over the last 20 years have not beaten the S&P. So, and there's a mathematical reason why actually, right? Is that because every manager has is doing trading. So you have slippage, cost of commissions, you have taxes, and you have the fact that you're selecting out of this basket. So by definition, if the S&P is 500 names, if one manager selects 100 of those names and another manager selects 100, then one of them is going to be more right and one more wrong because one is above average, one is below average because together they're the average. So now you're selecting which one is going to be below, which one's going to be up. So you have a new selection problem of which manager. All the hurdles against you when you're doing anything it translates into this data that we see that very few people can beat the market. So why all this fuss? Just buy the market. The only reason people don't, in my view, and I guess my opinion, my experience, is that you want to control volatility. So we build these great portfolios, which are not great because they're necessarily beating the market every year. They're great because they're doing similar to the market and much lower vol. That's what you're buying is you're buying consistency. So if 8 9% a year is the S&P, to be able to achieve 8 9 a year, we can't do this, but let's say every single year for the last 25 years, with that level of stability means that whenever you need your money, it's there at that level. That's the ultimate achievement to me is to achieve consistency, not outperformance, which is much harder on the pure return side. So if one were to buy and hold something forever, then volatility becomes irrelevant because you're holding it forever. Therefore, you've subtracted the only thing that you're fighting to mitigate. So if you no longer have that fight to mitigate because it doesn't matter to you anymore because you're in forever, then just buy the thing that you're always trying to beat. Wayne, this has been fun. Thank you for joining me. Thank you very much for having me. 